Welcome back all. Up until this point, we've been reading the works of Archaic Age authors like Homer and Hesiod, who have been describing events that supposedly happened in the Bronze Age. Well, in order for us to go further and start reading the tragedies we're going to be reading in our next unit, it's probably important for you to understand some of the social developments that happened in the time that intervened between the Bronze Age and the Classical Era we'll be discussing elsewhere in this class. So let's take a look at the map and have a look at the Greece described by Homer in his Iliad. And we can see that certain towns like Iolcus and Archomenos, Thebes, Athens, and Mycenae, Tiryns, these are all homes to heroes of Homer's Odyssey and Iliad. Um, these appear on the map. Um, and what was going on during this time? Well, in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, uh, we see men who are the aristoi, or the best, who are ruling over other men because they possess arete, or personal excellence. They're concerned about their time and their kleos. And in our more recent readings, in the Odyssey, we actually see the oikos, or the basic unit of human existence in the Greek world. Oikos is the Greek word for house, uh, but it can be broadly used to mean any kind of building that houses a family, and an extended family. Um, and in the case of the Bronze Age, we see that the oikos could actually refer to a palace complex, like the one I showed you at Mycenae. The household of the oikos um, joins together with other households to form a genus, or clan. And we see that the household of Agamemnon at Mycenae represents just such a clan. Uh, in these oikoi, the basileus would be the king or the chief, and just to give you a sense of what an oikos might have looked like, I wanted to show you this palace at Knossos in Crete. Sir Arthur Evans excavated this over a century ago. And you can see that this building at Crete is no ordinary house. It's actually quite an elaborate building with enormous columns. And in this particular case, we have a building that's over 100,000 square feet in size. So it's safe to say that this would be almost like a miniature city, and you would think of it that more that way than a house. Well, around 1200, things went wrong in Greece, and all of what we now think of as Greece was plunged into what we call the Dark Age, which lasted from 1200 to 750 BCE. Many of the large palace complexes, like the one I just showed you, uh, were abandoned or destroyed, and they were not rebuilt. And during this period, all of our archaeological record indicates that we have very little evidence of trade or writing. We don't know why this happened. There's evidence of fires throughout the Bronze Age palaces. However, we don't know whether there was a natural event, such as an earthquake, or if there were large-scale invasions which swept these palaces off the face of the earth. In any event, things changed during this time. However, Greece would emerge on the other side and be radically changed. You see, Homer lived in the period after the Dark Age in what we call the Archaic Age. This is the age that followed the Dark Age. What makes it different? Let's talk about that. The Archaic Age from 750 to 500 BCE is often thought of by scholars as the Age of Experiment or the Age of Reason or a kind of Greek Renaissance. And it's during this period that the area that we think of as Greek expanded greatly. Um, and this is because that anywhere Greek was spoken could be thought of as Hellas, and Hellas is the Greek word for Greece. Um, and the archaeological record for this period is, has a lot to say about what the Greeks were up to during this period. So let's have a look. Greece during this period expanded greatly. And what do I mean by this? I mean Greeks went from living in this area right here to traveling all over the Mediterranean world, putting out colonies in what is now France, what is now Spain, all around the Black Sea and North Africa. Why did they do this? They did this, they did this because the archeological record from this period suggests as much as a seven-fold growth of population within the space of just a few generations. Towns, like the one on this map, spread out colonies and sent Greeks far and wide to live in those places. These people took their language with them. And here's a great example of this. There's a large ancient Greek town in, of all places, Italy, a town called Paestum. And here's one of the many ruins in this town 
of a temple. Well, what are some things we can take away? What kinds of things were going on during this period? During the Archaic Age, the Aristoi, the aristocrats we learned about in Homer's times, started to have less control. And instead of the oikos being the main unit of government or political existence during this period, we move to a different model. Suddenly power doesn't radiate out from the palace, power radiates out from the city. So we have the emergence of, some, of what we'll call the polis or city-state. It's around this time, it's around this time, the Greeks started investigating their natural world, engaging in something called philosophia, or love of knowledge. And this gets into a lot of things. I think often when people think of philosophy, they think of uh, men scratching their beards and talking about deep thoughts. Uh, philosophia can include anything from thinking deep thoughts about the nature of existence to experiments with optics and electricity. Thales of Miletus was a man who was very interested in philosophia, and he used his knowledge of how math worked to predict a solar eclipse in 585 BCE. Why do I tell you this? We're concerned with this because this means he was using his knowledge of the way the natural world worked to explain an event like a solar eclipse rather than chalking it up to something the gods had done. So men were applying reason to their world and thinking in ways that were different than they were before. And this gets us into what the Greek language has to say about its world. Uh, there is something embedded in the grammar of the Greek language um, that makes the Greeks naturally well suited to cataloging their natural environment and talking about it. And this, this phrase right here, tomen tode, which means loosely, on the one hand, on the other. So, in many Greek sentences, you'll see this phrase, it sets up comparisons, one thing to another. And this is good because the Greeks who were living around this period were looking for logos, or reason, explanations, in their cosmos, or universe. And they weren't satisfied with the old explanations anymore, they wanted something new. This gets us to Athens. Democracy, coming from the Greek word demokratia, is a compound of the word demos, or people, and kratos, which means rule. People I want you to think of at the beginning of the process of the Athenians getting democracy are a family known as the Pisistratids. And they're so-called because of a man named Pisistratus. He became the leader of a group of disenfranchised poor people who in 560 occupied the Acropolis in Athens. And this is the upper city in Athens right here. He was almost immediately kicked out of the city, but he came back again in 558, this time with the help of a very tall woman posing as Athena. And the amazing thing is, it worked. However, he got kicked out again. But in 546, he came back and stayed in power as a tyrant until he died in 527. His sons, Hippias and Hipparchus, rule Athens until Hippias is murdered in 514 and Hipparchus is expelled in 510. What happened next? It was after they were kicked out that the emergence of democracy happened in Athens. During this time, reforms were made. What did Athenian democracy look like? Every adult citizen, that is males who were 30 years of age or older, were allowed to vote and to hold office. Speaking in front of the assembly was very important, and trials were held in public court for the purpose of upholding the law. Previously, a kind of vendetta justice had existed and had pitted neighbor against neighbor. And this put the government in between them. Who brought this to Athens? A man named Cleisthenes. And he was actually helped out by his noble family, by the people of Athens, in driving the Pisistratids out. Um, and he did this by promising that in return the Athenians would get democracy. His rival, Isagoras, not wanting Cleisthenes to get the upper hand, got help from the Spartans to drive Cleisthenes out of the city. However, Cleisthenes is forced out, but not for long. He came back and in 507 stirred things up. What did he do? He changed the division of Athens from four tribes that correspond mainly to people's families to ten tribes that corresponded to where you lived, your neighborhood. And these tribes were called deems. He banned all names derived from the name of one's father and instituted names derived from one's deem. So you will be Bob from Silver Spring rather than Bob Smith, if that makes any sense. He increases the city council, or, or boule, to 500 citizens. 
with 50 from each team, so each team was equally represented. Members of the boule were chosen by lot, not by family connection. He also reorganized the law courts so that between 201 and 5,001 jurors could be chosen at any time, and the reason for this was to discourage corruption through bribery. He introduces the punishment of ostracism, whereby a citizen could be sent into exile for a period of 10 years if 6,000 votes for ostracism were cast. Finally, he created a system whereby 10 strategoi, or generals, were elected, one from each team, and served one-year terms of offices. So this was truly a radical democracy. But let's talk about that for a minute. What's in a name? Cleisthenes never referred to his reforms as democratia or democracy. Um, this was actually a pretty loaded term in Athens at the time. Demos didn't just mean people. It also had the connotation of rabble or scum. Instead, he liked the term isonomia, which means equal rule. So people were equally in charge of their fates in this new system. It's this new system of government that will give birth to the art that we're going to talk about in my next lecture on Aeschylus' Eumenides. Stay tuned.